Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and it is my distinct pleasure and honor to have Dr. Robert Cialdini on this podcast. Dr. Cialdini is the New York Times bestselling author of Influence and Persuasion. Both of these books have sold together over 7 million copies in 44 different countries. That's astounding. Bob is also known around the world for his scientific work on what leads people to say yes to requests. Many people know him for the Cialdini Principles of Persuasion. Dr. Cialdini's new and expanded influence book just came out earlier this month. Among other new findings in his new book, he reveals his seventh principle of persuasion. And he is also referred to as the godfather of influence. Bob, it's so great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Stefan. I'm looking forward to it. So first of all, I would love to hear what is it about influence that still excites you? Because clearly you have a passion for it that has not waned in decades. So what is it about it that keeps you excited? I think it's the universality of it. There's not a person I know who would not be interested to know how to become more influential. And also how to resist the appeals of those people who are trying to influence us in unwelcome or undue ways. So it's both sides of the coin. And I think everybody that I've talked to says, oh yeah, tell me more about that because that's likely to impact my daily uh, interactions and even effectiveness within those interactions. Right, it's universally applicable whether you are the marketing director of a company, your business owner, your um, a, a new employee, your a consumer, or you're a homeless person. It doesn't matter who you are, what roles you play, you need to know about influence because you're either on the influencing side or you're on the being influenced side, or both. Exactly. And let me just uh, take up where you left off with the homeless person. There's actually research to show how a homeless person could double the likelihood that someone will contribute to them when they ask for a donation on the street. It is to add a sentence. Of course, it's completely up to you. And that more than doubles the likelihood that people will feel willing to do so because you've given them the responsibility of deciding in a way that's very much also granting them the freedom to do so, right? Explicitly. Now, we can go all the way up to the top of the line. How does a a leader do this, uh, get people to say yes? And one of the things that we found is very often uh, the most effective communicators need to know when they are not the most effective communicator. And they need to give the task to someone inside their organization who might seem more comparable to the individuals that they are trying to move in that direction than the person at the top who might be seen as as being too uh, different from the average individual, and people aren't all that interested in following that individual's lead. But if we get uh, the, let's say in a team meeting, uh, the, the, the manager saying to somebody who's already gotten on board with a new initiative, so Jim or Janet, can you tell me why you would like, why, why you think that this new initiative that we're pushing is the right thing to do? Now those people who are hanging back don't just hear from their boss, they hear from their peers. And in this new edition that, uh, of the book that you're talking about, we have a whole section called Persuasion, which is a more muscular form of persuasion. So you can harness that kind of strength of the principles of influence. Yeah, that's so cool. I remember this video that went viral of a homeless person who... Uh, had something written on on a piece of cardboard and people were just passing him by, passing him by, passing him by. And then one lady uh, came and wrote something different on the backside of it. 
and she yes. gave it back to the to the homeless person who incidentally was blind so he didn't right. see what what uh, she had written and all the money just was flowing in he kept hearing change thrown into into his uh, hat all day long because of right. the words and then she comes back later and he asked, "Well, what did you what did you write on this? Uh, I'll I'll include uh, an embed of this video in the show notes uh, for this episode. It's really beautiful. And I, I recall something about it's a beautiful day, and I unfortunately don't have the eyes to see it, but you yeah. do, or something along those lines. And you're very close. It was it's springtime, and I am blind. All he had there was." I am blind. Now she says, it's springtime, and I am blind. And people see the inequity there between what they are enjoying and what this man, unfortunately, cannot enjoy. And now they seek to redress that inequity by giving some resources to him. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Really, really um, heartwarming and touching as well. Now, if someone is trying to, uh, let's say, do do good in the world, so they've got a mission, they have a nonprofit or something, and they want to inspire people to participate in this mission, in this movement, maybe right. donate or volunteer or tell their friends and, and so forth, what are some of the best examples you found out there in terms of, of uh, sparking this kind of a movement? And what are some of the worst examples? Well, uh, certainly one of, let's start with one of the worst examples. It's that you're not getting enough, you, you, you're not getting enough donations, right? It's, it's, you're not having the success you want. And so what you say is, so many people are failing to recognize the importance of this cause and not donating to our, uh, our, our, our mission, right? Serious mistake, because you have just normalized the tendency not to give to this organization. You're saying most of the people around you, like you, aren't doing this. And what our research shows is that when you tell people that the majority aren't doing this, this, this is a regrettable thing that the majority of people are failing to do this, they take their cue from what the majority did. It's called the principle of social proof. You decide what you should do based on what the people around you are doing. So the opposite, it, you know, it, you, you never want to say that. You never want to say that. And here's what I think you can do, even if you're not getting a lot of contributions, even if, let's say, you're a startup organization or you it's a, a new charity that doesn't have a lot of traction as yet. What we find is if you show a trend in the direction to where you are, even if it's a minority, now the minority status of that number, let's say, we're only getting 20% uh, of the people that we uh, ask to donate, or so we're only at 20% of what we think uh, we need to be in order to be effective, right? If you say that, oh, you're telling people most people don't think it's worthwhile, right? And so what you get is less contributions, actually, f fewer contributions. But if you say six months ago, it was 10%. Three months ago, it was 15%. Now it's 20%. Now you get more contributions as a result because of a new kind of social proof that you've established with that trend, future social proof. There's a human tendency to project a trend into the future. So people will say, oh, well, that means in the future it's going to be even more and more and more, and eventually the majority of people will be doing this. So if you've got a good idea, but it's early in the process, maybe it's a new product or a service or an idea or a charity organization, 
and you don't have the popularity yet that allows you to use social proof, right? the majority are doing this, you can use a trend toward the majority and get there much faster. Yeah, that's amazing because when our brains extrapolate that we're, we're already kind of pre-selling ourselves on the value of it, uh, even though it hasn't arrived yet. That's right. Um, and so, uh, again, we want to be sure never to say only 20 uh, percent are doing this because that's going to cause people to be less likely to do it. But if you get there in a trend, it reverses the process. And now you're winning instead of losing with that 20 percent. Yeah, I, I recall you shared an example, a study of, uh, of uh, I think it was utility customers whether it was water usage or electricity usage, something along those lines. Do you recall uh, what I'm referring to? Yes. Um, there was a, there's a company that I was the uh, chief scientific officer for for a, a few years called O Power that had as its business model, they would partner with utility companies, energy companies, and send to all of the customers of those companies not just information that compared what, how much energy they were using that month compared to the previous month or the previous month or the previous year from that month, you know, it, they said, instead, here's how you're doing relative to your most comparable neighbors. The people who are close to you, who have the same size home, who have the same kind of uh, air conditioning and heating system, have the same number of rooms, you could get all that information from census tract data, right? And here's where you stand next to them, relative to them. That has been a wild success. In the 10 years that O'Power has been in business, we have been able to uh, reduce 3 billion pounds of carbon dioxide from being put into the environment by people reducing their energy conservation, uh, their, their energy consumption. They have saved an average of $790 million a year, consumers, by simply adjusting their consumption to that of their neighbors who are doing better than them. Comparable neighbors. It means that, well, if they can do it, I can do it, right? It becomes feasible to do this if you see that those around you just like you are able to do it. Yeah, that brings up another point that I just was floored by initially, but it made all the sense in the world in retrospect, and that was the power of the mediocre or mildly impressive case study. So I learned about this from uh, one of my coaches, James Shramko, who's an internet marketer. Uh, he's spoken many times at Traffic and Conversion Summit, like you've, you've spoken there as well. And he talks about how if you give a case study on your website or in a presentation or whatever, that is light years beyond the audience's uh, present state or where they're even seeing themselves in the future. Okay, I had a client, uh, Chanel, that did this and that, and they were able to get these kind of results. And like, Chanel, I'm not Chanel. I'll never be Chanel. Like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, their brain essentially shuts off for the rest of it. So the mildly impressive case study is one where it's like, we got 30% growth <laughs> in, right. in the course of a 12-month time period and went from X to, to Y. Uh, thoughts on that? No, no, exactly right. You're hitting right on the bullseye of comparability. Uh, if those individuals are like you, then you start taking their experiences in and comparing them to your own. If somebody's way beyond you, you know, the, the, even though there's a tendency for communicators to want to present the, the most positive face on what they've been able to accomplish, by doing that, you're shutting down the, the, the tendency of the people who you're speaking to to see a connection to themselves. 
So they don't really process that information deeply as a result or accept it as relevant to them. Yeah. Very true, very true. Now let's talk about what is uh, feasible in terms of, let, let's talk about the line where ethical influence ends and fabricated or unethical influence begins. How do you know where that line is, whether you are on the delivering side or on the receiving side? This is such an important question because it seems to me that to be a long term successful source of influence, you have to, from the beginning, be ethical in every step along the way so that uh, you do get the, the buy in. Uh, of uh, of the people and and it, you don't want to step over that line because if they see you as having an intent to deceive them with these approaches you just crash in terms of your credibility so what's the differentiator i claim there are seven universal principles of influence that move people in your direction We've already talked about one of them, social proof, that if a lot of people like you are doing this, it's probably the right thing for you to do. Another one is authority. If the experts are doing this, it's the right, then you'll probably reduce your uncertainty of what you should do in that situation because the, the knowledgeable people are urging uh, this particular step. All right. So here's the or here's another one is scarcity. If what you have is scarce or rare or unique or dwindling in availability, if you tell people that they want it more, right? we want more of those things we can have less of. Right? Well, here's the differentiator between influence and manipulation. You're a successful influencer if you point to something that's truly there. Do you really have social proof? Do you really have a, a, a popular uh, approach, a lot of a trending influence in your direction? Do you really have the voices of legitimate authorities who can, uh, who can speak to the direction that you're asking people to take? Do you really have a unique, uncommon uh, feature of what you have to offer that nobody else can provide? Simply pointing to those things is entirely ethical. Not only is it ethical, I think it's commendable to do that. It's not only not objectionable, it's commendable to inform people of what the true sources of influence that typically steer them correctly are in that situation. The unethical person is the one who fabricates that popularity, claims it by lying with statistics or just outright lying or choosing a, a voice of somebody who's not really an expert on the topic, but implying that this person is or uh, claiming that this is our last product, this is our last m uh, model or our last item when it's not. There's others in the storeroom. You're just getting people to choose it because it's the last one. That's the difference. Do you point to something and thus educate people into assent? Or do you trick them? Do you deceive them into a dis uh, assent? That's the differentiator. Mm. And I'm also thinking about times where there's information asymmetry and it's just selectively chosen which things to share with you. Like if you're a car salesperson, you're not going to share that, well, this had an accident and, you know, it's repaired now and so forth, unless you're specifically asked, perhaps. Hopefully they will volunteer it, but many probably would not. And then there are aspects uh, that are very favorable uh, that are being immediately shown. Well, let me show you this and that and the other thing from our invoice uh, or whatever like this is the information that is favorable but the stuff that's not they're kind of uh right. you know it, I, they might call it a white lie because they're omitting things i actually think it's a, a, a brazen lie 
to to withhold that information. I'm on your side on this one. And I'll tell you why I think you're right, not just in terms of the morality of being sure people are properly informed about both sides, but because it turns out to be more effective if you mention a weakness in your case early in your presentation so that people have been informed that you are not only knowledgeable about the topic, you know the pros and the cons, you're trustworthy enough to describe the cons as well as the pros. Stefan, that's the moment after you have admitted a weakness to mention your strongest argument, your most compelling feature, your, your most attractive aspect of your case, because people now view the next thing you say as coming from a credible communicator. If you never mentioned that weakness, they wouldn't know that about you. Or if you buried it at the end of your presentation, right? which is what most people do. First of all, they present all of the strengths. And then at the end, they might mention a weakness. Let's say you're, a, you know, in uh, you're an advisor, a financial advisor, and you, you, you want somebody to move in a particular direction and you tell them all the strengths of this. And then at the end you say, but of course there are tax consequences and there are, uh, this may take a little bit longer to show a profit than uh, some of the other things we've been considering. If you mention those things first, and then you just say, but here are the things that I am enthusiastic about and they're why I'm recommending this, despite what the weaknesses may be, those strengths now become perceived as something people process more deeply and believe more fully. Warren Buffett does this every year in the letter he sends to his stockholders, right? Uh, for Berkshire Hathaway, his amazingly effective uh, uh, company. On the first or second page of his report to shareholders, he mentioned something that went south that year, something that didn't go according to his hopes. And he says, but we've learned from this and that will never happen again. Now let me tell you all the things that went right. I've been getting his reports for over 20 years now. And every time he does it, I say to myself, wow, this guy's a straight shooter. He's coming up with this thing that went wrong. Normally, a CEO buries it in some footnote on page 43, right? No, this guy's up front with us. What's the next thing he's, he's going to say? And then he talks about all the strengths. And because of that, I have never sold the single share of Berkshire Hathaway stock that I received 25 years ago as a gift, right? when it was, it was a gift. It was from his partner, Charlie Munger, who sent it to me. He said, your book has made so much money for us by one of your principles called the principle of reciprocation that says we have to give back to those we have given to them. You are owed this. It was worth $75,000. 25 years ago. Today, it's worth $430,000. And I never sold it. Even when it was making all these, I had doubled and tripled and quadrupled my profit because every year, Warren Buffett would convince me about the strengths of the case for Berkshire Hathaway by first mentioning a weakness in that case. That is so smart. I love that. And uh, what a great example. Now, if I were to uh, pitch you to be on this podcast and I would start with a weakness, 
Now you said yes without me doing this, but <laughs> if I had said, you know, we're not very popular in terms of podcasts. Uh, the number of downloads isn't very impressive, to be frank. But I have had guests like Tim Ferriss and Dave Asprey and Jay Abraham and, and so forth. Then that would potentially be more uh, influential and uh, persuasive than if I had just simply launched in with, I'd love to have you on yeah. my podcast and here are some of the guests. I'm not ready to accept all of the positives until you've shown me your credibility. I'm not open to them. They, they're they bouncing off me. Even your strongest arguments might bounce off because I don't know whether I can trust what you're saying. But we, if you if you tell me something that's true, that's a weakness in your case, I now trust the next thing you say differently. And if you tell me about Tim Ferriss and uh, all the... Well, now I go, wow. Okay, so the key to all of this is the word but. You don't just say, here, here are all the things wrong with, first of all, you never say, here are all the things wrong with me and my <laughs> podcast. And, you know, no, you mention a weakness relatively early, not the very first thing you say to people. You mentioned that, right? And then you say, but, or however, or nonetheless, and that's a bridge into your strengths. And do you, I have a friend who's a psycholinguist. She studies the psychology of language. She said, do you know what the word but signifies in every human language? Take what you just heard and put it away and focus your attention on the next thing I'm going to say. Can you see why we want our weaknesses before the but? That's what you put away. And our strengths after the but? But tells us now focus here. That's where the strength should be. So I advise people, do you want to know where to put your strongest argument? You put it in the moment after you've mentioned a weakness that your strengths can just sweep away. Yeah, and to use this uh, the wrong way would be, for example, to give a compliment to somebody and then the, the criticism after the but because they've exactly wiped right. out the entire compliment and all they heard was the negative commentary that's right yeah that's right now if instead of the word but you use the word because then you can mm -hmm. get all sorts of powerful influence there too and you're not going to use a, a weakness in that example but you're going to no. give a reason that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the thing you're trying to get from them right well, there's a study that shows that, but of course we want to, to have we want to give a reason that uh, that's aligned with the direction we want people to go. But the the study that you're talking about is a classic in behavioral science, um, in which researchers at Harvard University went to the university library and they wanted to see how what they could do to get people to allow them to skip ahead of them in line, right? And in the control condition. They walked up to the people and said, excuse me, I have eight pages. Can I st skip ahead of you in line? Right. And 60 percent of the time they were successful. If they said, excuse me, I have eight pages. Can I skip ahead of you because I'm in a rush? Now they got 94 percent. Right. But here's the key. If they had in a third condition, they walked up and said, excuse me, I have eight pages. Can I skip ahead of you because I have to make some copies? I have to make some copies <laughs> is not any new information. Everybody in that line has to make copies. 93% say yes. It wasn't the reason it was the word because that foretold of a reason that was about to follow. 
And when pr people heard the word because, they thought, okay, here comes a reason. And we need reasons, <laughs> and people want reasons in order to, to uh, say yes to things. So you're exactly right. If we foretell the reason that's about to come with the word because, people become attuned to the next thing you're going to say. Once again, they focus their attention on the next thing you're going to say. And if you've got a good reason there, you go from 60% to 94% in this particular situation. Yeah, I love that study. That's so good. Now, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with, or we probably are familiar with Jay Abraham. Uh, are you guys friends, perhaps? <laughs> We have been on the same dais together, uh, but we're not personal friends, but I certainly know and respect his work. Yeah, he's, he's great. And one of his principles is the principle of preeminence. If the prospect is better served by being sent elsewhere, then it isn't just your ethical responsibility, it's good business to send them to your competitor. I'd love to hear your analysis of this from from the influence and seven principles perspective. Yeah, so it is credibility again, the principle of authority. And there's the most powerful kind of authority influence that you can be is one who has credibility in the eyes of the prospect. And that means you are knowledgeable and you are trustworthy. Well, by saying we're not right for you, here's uh, a, a, a better option for you. You have just established yourself as knowledgeable and trustworthy, right? The key is the next time that person needs something other than what they've gotten from the rival, they're gonna come to you first because you have established yourself as a source of information that they can believe explicitly. And now you're in a position to make recommendations for things that they don't even, if you do say, now we do have exactly what you need, we can really help you. They don't ever think about going to a arrival. You've already closed the deal weeks before before, months before, you've closed the deal. You know, uh, there's a, the, the ancient uh, Chinese uh, military uh, expert, Sun Tzu, said, every battle is won before it's fought. It's what you do first. And what Jay was saying, you can do something months ahead of time, and you've won a battle that has yet to be engaged at that point. It's the next time you, you give them a recommendation, they're gonna believe it. They're not even gonna think about going elsewhere now. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love the book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. My favorite quote yeah. from that book is, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. <laughs> <laughs> right, me too. I love that one. Yeah, yeah. Now, speaking of books, uh, you have a very impressive number of books sold for both of your books. I'm curious what your thoughts are about ethical and unethical book launch strategies, because I have many friends who have book launches uh, either coming up or in progress right now, and I'm going to have some books launching here in the next uh, year, probably three of them. And I would love to hear the best of the best sort of examples and some of the cringeworthy examples that you couldn't believe actually worked but shouldn't have. <laughs> Well, certainly the best of the best is, again, to take uh, Sun Tzu's, uh, Tzu's advice and establish your credibility before the book is ever launched. And you do that by getting known experts, legitimate authorities on the subject of your book to write endorsements of it 
for the cover, the back, the inside pages, so that when people review those experts' opinions, right, in the launch, right, on the cover of the book or when the, the, the launch occurs, they see that I can reduce my uncertainty about whether this is a good book because so many experts are saying it is. So that's certainly one way to do it. Another way to do it, and I, I've done it with, uh, with this new edition of Influence that just came out. Uh, we added 220 pages to the previous edition. Right? So how, what did we label this? Not revised, new and expanded. So people recognized that they were going to get novel information here that, they, that wasn't in the previous edition, and it was greatly expanded beyond the previous edition, not just new, but a lot more information than they had uh, in, in the previous one. And then finally, because we had already sold 5 million copies of that book, the earlier versions of it. We were insistent with our publisher. You need to put that on the cover of the book. It's social proof. It's not just the experts who are on the back of the book endorsing it. It's people like potential readers, just like the people we want uh, to, to, to move in our direction for this one. Five million people have done it. And as you mentioned in, in your uh, introduction, in 44 different languages. So it speaks to the fact that these are universal kinds of uh, insights into the human condition. If we can get that many people from that much of a diverse set of, of countries wanting the information. So all those, those were the those were the things that I I did. Here's one of the things that I I had to fight for in order to get a previous edition. Um, my publisher, we by that time we had sold. It was the third edition. We had sold uh, uh, like three million copies of the book. The previous by the previous edition was like one point five million. And they didn't want to. They didn't want to put the new number on there. That, and I had to fight and fight and fight to get. They said, "No, no, we need that space for the uh, for the design of the cover. It's important that we not have too much information in there." And I said, "Too much information. This is the crucial information." <laughs> Take something else out. You know, they they had what's called white. They needed white space on the cover. You know, uh, this is what designers do. They need to have enough space in there so it's a welcoming image for people who are looking. But you don't take out the crucial thing that is a lever of influence that's in the book as to what you should do. Right. So. Yeah, those are the kinds of battles you have to fight. Yeah, and what what's an example that you know of from other book launches where it's a little bit cringeworthy what what they did? They use as in, endorsers of the book what we call blurbers. They put uh, on people who are associates associates of theirs. And you, of course, or friends of theirs, not independent voices in this. And so you say, well, come on, that has to do with something else than the quality of the material. It has to do with the quality of the relationship you have to the person who's endorsing it. Yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> I have asked friends to write book blurbs for me, uh, famous friends, and I've asked people who barely know me to write uh, blurbs, and I just never thought twice about the difference between those two. I just threw them all in the same pot and then 
put them into the front matter of the book or the back cover and like, yeah, there we go. You know what I've seen and, and I've actually had, yeah, is I've, I've actually uh, advised a, a, a friend of mine who was, he showed me this list of uh, endorsers, two of whom said, not only do not only uh, do I have a, a, a lot of experience with X, my, the, the author, let's say his name is Jim, it wasn't, right? He's a friend of mine. What? It's in the blurb <laughs> that there's a reason <laughs> for this praise that doesn't necessarily have to do with the merits of the presentation there. It has to do with a friendship. Take that out. <laughs> Ask that person to take out that line about friendship. It just, it, it corrupts the independence of the judgment. Do you think it's unethical to include the blurb at all because of the friendship? No, I don't think it's unethical, but I think it's, if, if, anybody knows about the friendship it's less it's suboptimal to to do it yeah gotcha and and what do you think about the the, i don't even know what they call them it's not a marketplace but it's more like a community of people who get paid in free product Mm -hmm. for giving an amazon review yeah i think that's troubling yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> I know that now there are more and more restrictions that those things have to be announced for influencers, for example, who use a particular product or present it on their blog or um, they have to transparently say, I'm being paid to do this by this or I'm being given this. Uh, Otherwise, it becomes unethical, I think, uh, because of that other source of influence besides the quality of the thing, the thing that's on offer. Yeah, I I think it's unethical. And if, if someone's getting paid in free product or cash or gift cards or anything, that's just... Uh, yeah, that's that's slimy in my opinion. And um, if someone is also faking Amazon reviews, that's even worse. That's a whole other level, but oh. it happens a lot. There is so much fakery going on yes. and manipulation uh, with Amazon sellers. And Amazon is constantly trying to develop algorithms to detect and delete those kinds of fakes. But it's not always possible because the, the the fakers are getting more sophisticated. But here's a fascinating result that I saw in in, in uh, as it applies to how influences employed in online platforms. You know, everybody looks at star ratings. Right? You know what? Ironically, is not the most successful. Um, star rating to create a conversion five stars is not gotcha it turns out the most successful is a range between 4.2 and 4.7 stars below 4.2 you say well maybe this isn't such a great product above 4.7 you say well maybe this isn't all legitimate (laughs) Maybe the, there's fakery in here, right? So uh, one of the things I'm happy with in the reviews of the new book is that we're at 4.7 right now. And the ones who are saying three point or two point, right? A uh, star, th- three stars. The reasons they're giving are great. They're like, oh, well, the, the, the book arrived damaged. Or, <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't like the font size. Right? Okay, well, good. All right. Those are legitimate concerns and they should be uh, registered, but they don't undermine the... But I think if you ever do get a negative review on your site, you should 
always respond to it. Now, it doesn't have to be in a confrontational way. You can always respond to it and say, well, I'm sorry you, you, you feel that way, but, right, there's your but, I'm so glad that the great, great majority of, of reviewers have not felt that way. Mm. Yeah, and so what about the advice that many, many internet marketers give to not feed the trolls? Don't, don't give them any further attention when they're uh, dissing you in, let's say, a YouTube comment or uh, a blog comment. I think that's correct if you're going to be confrontational because that what that does is get their backs up or they love that. They love to be involved in an exchange with somebody famous, right? No, you're conciliatory. You say, I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm so glad that the great majority of people don't. What are they going to say to that? They've seen it. That mean, the great majority of people don't. Yeah. Now you've got social proof and credibility on your side. Hmm. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Now, what is your opinion on online reputation management? Or um, it's a form of manipulation in a way because you're pushing negative commentary off of page one on Google. It's a it's it, it's a, a form of SEO in in, in that way. But it's yep. also uh, stacking the deck in your favor without letting people immediately see the detractors or the negative commentary. Is that ethical, unethical? Does it depend on whether it's a legitimate organization or person? Or uh, what, what's your view on that? So I, I, I think is less than ethical. Uh, you want to be as tra uh, transparent as possible, but you always want to have something to say to those individuals. I know some of them may be trolls, but you can you can disarm them by saying the sort of thing that we talked about a minute ago, or saying, but you know, the evidence isn't in your favor in that regard because X or Y. You 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 always should have something to disarm them rather than to confront them um, and and uh, dismiss them or derogate them. It should be evidence-based or uh, something that uh, you, you can say, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I noticed that uh, very few people feel that way. Yep. Okay, good point. I know there's a principle that you call unity, and I didn't really get the the impact of that until recently I heard you present a, a, a genius network uh, or was it metal? <laughs> I forget which one. Anyways, I heard you present. It was phenomenal. And you gave some examples of unity in action and how persuasive that is. And I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit of this uh, for our listener. So let me give you a, per, a, a personal example and then a more general one. But, uh, a few years ago, I was writing a report that was due the next day. And as I was re reading over it, I saw that one section of it was weak. It didn't really have the evidence I needed to clearly make a compelling case for what I was claiming. But I knew a colleague of mine in the psychology department where I work had done some research uh, the year before, and he had the data in his archives. So I sent him an email. I said, said, Tim, not his real name, Tim, uh, I explained, I uh, have this thing, it's due tomorrow, I don't have the data, I know you do, could you go to your archives, could you get out the data and send them to me today so I could get this report done on time? I'm going to call you and ask uh, you to, uh, to do that and give you some of the specifics of what I need. So I called him, he said, Bob, I know why you called, and the answer is no. Look, you... I can't be I can't be responsible for your poor time management skills. You it's due tomorrow, but so what? I have things due tomorrow too. Why why would I change uh, prioritize yours over mine? And if I hadn't read the stuff about unity that says we say yes 
to those people who share important categories that define our identity with us, people who are one of us, right? We just say yes to those people. If I hadn't seen that research, I would have said, come on, Tim, I need this, it's due tomorrow. He had already said no to that. I said, come on, Tim, we have been in the same psychology department now for 12 years. I really need this. And I had the data that afternoon. I was one, he, he had to say, yes, I was of him. I was, I was a member of the psychology department with him. how many fellow organizational or company or in, in family members. I mean, do, do we, can we just say, you know, we've been together now for a long time. I really would wish you'd do this for me. Now, here's the general example. So suppose you've got a new initiative. You want the buy-in of the people around you so you can move that initiative up the ladder. And uh, you want to ask for their uh, input on your new idea, right? And get their, their buy-in for it. And what we typically do is give them like a, a, an outline of our idea or a blueprint of it and say, can you give me some feedback on this? It's fine to ask for their input. It's, it's great, actually. But the word you should use to ask for their input is not the one we usually use. We usually say, can you give me your opinion on this? Well, here's the truth. When you ask for somebody's opinion, you get a critic. Instead, if you change one word and ask for their advice instead of their opinion, now you get a partner. You, you get someone you've invited into the process of collaborating with you on this process. Mm -hmm. And the research shows if you change that one word, they see themselves as with you now on this. Because you've asked for their advice, you ask them to collaborate with you on it. And what you get is a significantly more positive response to the very same idea if you ask for advice about it versus opinion or even the most recent research I've seen, even if you ask for feedback, you don't get as positive a, a, and as helpful a response. I would have guessed that feedback would have been critical as well. Um, counsel, on the other hand, I would think would be like advice. It would be yes. asking them to, in a, sen in, in a sense, uh, partner with you on it. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen the research on that. I don't think there has been anybody who's done that research, but I, I bet you're right. Yeah. Amazing. So I know we're out of time. I wanted to uh, be sure our listener knows where to get your book and more materials, perhaps some uh, videos of you speaking and so forth. I'm sure there's got to be some great stuff on YouTube and on your website and so forth. Where do they go to learn more from you besides, of course, Amazon to pick up the book? <laughs> well, you're right about our website. It is influenceatwork.com. And there we've got access to information about our books and uh, speaking opportunities, training. We even have a brand new on-demand online uh, principles of persuasion workshop that people can uh, uh, subscribe to if they wanted to learn about ethical influence, effective and ethical influence. That's available there too. But of course, In the choice is up to you. Yes, <laughs> it's completely up to you. <laughs> but, but influenceatwork.com awaits awesome. if it is <laughs> perfect and uh i just i love what you're doing out there in the world you're making uh people aware of influence and using it ethically and also knowing when it's being used on them unethically uh you've got yeah just a, a lot of great 
karmic brownie points uh, accumulated, I'm sure, for all this great work. Well, now, thank you. I appreciate uh, hearing that. Yes. And thank you, listener. Now go out there and make a difference in the world using positive influence techniques, and we'll catch you on the next episode.